describe the kind of thinking, analysis, discernment that must have gone on in the mind of Nashikeda. And says Yamaraja that there are these two paths, either you call them Shreya or Preya, the path of the good and the path of the pleasure. Path of the lasting happiness and path of the fleeting happiness. <clears throat> the path of the short term good, short term gain, long term pain, or short term pain, long term gain. And that is why I require dhira, meaning a discriminating person who can look at every aspect of it who does not simply determine something based on what the immediate or short-term gain is, because that is why usually mind gets attracted for immediate gratification. That's human mind generally wants. But here we talk about delayed gratification. Doesn't go for immediate gratification. It's not that you should not go for some near go, but if you have to analyze, that this choice of immediate gratification results into subsequent pain in the sense of 
That choice makes me dependent because that happiness comes from a source other than myself. And when something comes from other than myself, then I become dependent upon the mercy of that thing. There is an uncertainty whether or not I will achieve what I am seeking because it comes from something different from me, that I cannot control that. There is an uncertainty, a fear, and even when it comes out, it always extracts a pound of flesh, a price from me. And ultimately that price turns away more than the gain, this is what is discovered in course of time. A discriminating person reviews all of this as to what is the investment involved, what is the cost involved and what's in that gain. And then comes to the conclusion that even though the path of Shreya or the path of good involves an initial pain if you want to call it pain. Pain in terms of restraining myself or my mind which has a tendency for immediate gratification, that tendency has to be restrained. A mind that has a attraction for the pleasures, immediate coming, pleasures coming from sense gratification, because that is the kind of happiness that it has been accustomed to so far. And therefore it naturally goes for that. So this extrovert tendency of the mind has to be controlled. We'll have a chance to discuss all this later, in a later verse. But this is a discriminative person, vivirakti. Vivirakti means vivekam karodi. He does viveka or discrimination from all sides. He examines something from all sides. It's called parikshanam. Paridayikshanam, not just looking at one aspect, but all the aspects. And then comes to the choice that what I am seeking can only be attained by choice of shreyas and not prayas. <clears throat> and thereby implying that Nachikata, you have been one of those diraha, you have been one of those discriminative ones who has made the choice of shreyas and you just let go all those temptations which are all placed on your path. At one point, Yamanaja even says to Nashikata that may I have a student like you, Tvadam Guyo Nashikata Prashta. Say Nashikata, may we have a Prashta or a questioner like you. Meaning that even the Guru also is in lookout for a, a, a deserving disciple, a, somebody who is ready for this knowledge. <coughs> who has no agenda other than this knowledge. <clears throat> when that is so, that is sure, sure that the attention of the student will be riveted on this, because there is no agenda. Since no other agenda, there was nothing attracts his mind, mind doesn't get distracted. Our mind gets distracted because there are so many agendas, so many things to be accomplished, so many things that are important to me. And this is one of those things that well, I'm when I am paying attention to this, some other thing comes which is also important and distracts my mind. When this is only agenda, then the mind is totally focused. It's called samadhanam, mm. meaning mind enjoys a focus or concentration. <coughs> Having said all of this, then the teacher begins the imparting of the Brahma Vidya, the knowledge of Brahman, even before that. It is traditional also to impart some instructions or to call upasana or meditation. <clears throat> so meditation becomes a means of knowledge. Dhyanam becomes a means of jnanam. Dhyanam means meditating upon what it is that you want to achieve. Worshipping what you are achieving. Meditation here means mental worship. So worship or bhakti or devotion or worship becomes the means of knowledge. And therefore, in a few verses, the teacher also talks about that worship. And how do you carry your worship of what you want to achieve? You want to know Atma, you want to know the Self, then worship of the Self, which also we discussed in the subsequent verse. <coughs> and 
that mental worship is called upasana or meditation. Meditation that the Upanishads prescribe is always meditation of Ishvara, worshipping mental worship of Ishvara. Ishvara is the one who I want to know. That is my goal. And being devoted to the goal, worshipping the goal, dwelling upon that with the attitude of devotion. For that also it is customary to give you a symbol or a prop or a, a, or a means called alambaram, something that you hold on to. It is like a ladder that I require in order to climb. It's, so similarly also a ladder is given to us, a means is given to us to meditate upon Brahman or meditate upon the self. And in this Upanishad, that means is Omkar, Om. So look at the passage 6 on the page 5. Sarve Vedaha Sarve Vedaha Yat Padam Amanande Tapamse Sarvani Cha Yat Padande Yadichantaha Brahmacharyam Charande Tate Padam Sangrahena Pravimi Om Ittyadha Tate Padam Last one says Tate Padam Sangrahena Pravimi That Padam Padam means the, here it is in the sense of goal, something that is to be reached, something that is to be achieved, something that is a goal. And the goal here is the self or Brahman. So Brahman or a God or self which is Padam, which is what you want to achieve. I will tell you briefly. There cannot be a more brief description of that than that. Om. So it is oh here it is not say it doesn't say Brahman, doesn't say Atma, doesn't say self, it says Om. That goal or Padam that is to be reached is Om. And there is also a praise of that Omkara in the first three quarters. Sarve Vedaha Yat Padamanandi. That which all the Vedas propound with one voice, that which is the subject matter of all the Vedas. All the Vedas are devoted to only one subject matter and that is Om. The profound, profound, with one voice, that goal, that which they propound with one voice, Sarve Veda. So they declare, they unfold, they teach, all the Vedas have their tatparya of purport in teaching about Veda, Om. Tapam teaches Sarvana Yad Badanti. For then the Vedas and scriptures also prescribe a lot of duties and rituals or actions which are also meant for attaining Omkara through the Antahagrashuddhi or purification of mind. So Vedas also provide a means because it is required that before you meditate, meditation also requires a mind which enjoys a relative freedom from distraction, which also enjoys a concentration and you have to make an effort to attain that mind and Karma Yoga performs of these rituals and duties as, as in, the, in, in spirit of worship is a means of that. So, tapa gumsi sar tapa gumsi sar sarvani yad vadanti. This, this dharma or the duty is called tapas. Tapas means actually penance. When you perform your duty, when you do what is right, that itself becomes a penance. 
Because in doing what is right, I have to overcome my impulse of what is convenient. Because often the mind wants to take shortcuts, does what is convenient, rather than having to do everything thoroughly and correctly and do what is right. So a tendency to take liberty, a tendency to take shortcuts, a tendency to compromise the values, that tendency has to be overcome in order to do what is right. So what is right versus what I like. So I must over restrain my tendency to do what I like and do with determination what is right. So that is called penance. That's the kind of penance talked about, the bus. Yet, and of course doing performance of action involves exertion plus also requires us the, the, the restraint in the mind, both of which are aspects of tapas or penance. Yadi chanto brahmacharyam charanti. And when you get prepared, having lived the life of karma yoga, lived the life of intelligence, lived the life of right values and attitudes, then when you gain that purification of mind, then there arises a desire for knowledge. And what do you do? Brahmacharyam charanti. Then you approach, go to the teacher, live with the teacher. That is called a brahmachari. A brahmachari, the student who lives with the teacher, serves the teacher, is dedicated to gaining knowledge from the teacher. So first, Vedas declare what the goal is. And to praise that goal, you can call it the Samhita section, or you can call it, you know, the, uh, which is where all the hymns are there. And then the Karmakanda section describes so many rituals, etc., called tapas. And desiring which knowledge one approaches teacher for the Upanishads. Tattepadam Sangrahena Brahmimi. Says here how all the different sections of Vedas are devoted to just one subject matter, that is Om. Although, in fact, all the Vedas are devoted to revealing Brahman, their reality. Which is also the self. But instead of using the Brahman, the word Om is used here because Om is the name of Brahman. He is most proximate to Brahman. And therefore, He Nachiketa, I will tell you about that, which is the means of attaining knowledge of Brahman, that is Om. So here, the teacher, before imparting the actual knowledge, prescribes meditation upon Brahman. Before knowing Brahman, the meditation or devotion to Brahman is what is prescribed here. That you concentrate your mind upon Brahman with devotion. So, meaning that you repeat Om, Om, Om in your own mind with devotion. And that becomes a mean that that Omkara itself becomes favorable to you and reveals the true nature which is Brahman. Meaning that in knowledge also we require the grace of the one that we want to know. What is meant by bhakti or devotion is that you can know something provided what you want to know becomes favorable to you. What you want to know reveals itself to you. When you gain, when you understand something, learn something, know something. Suppose uh, Newton, for example, discovered the law of gravity. Now, did he know or did that law reveal itself to Newton? Do you gain the knowledge or does the knowledge get revealed in your mind? Well, but if a very graceful way of saying is that it is by the grace of Ishvara that I know Ishvara. So we create in our mind conditions favorable by which we will attain the grace of Ishvara whom we want to know and thus he reveals himself in our mind. We will we'll come to that passage also subsequently. But that's the idea of this meditation or mental worship. 
is to tune up the mind with what it is that you want to know. And when the mind is, first is karma yoga, which is a means of purification of mind. Second is the dhyanam or upasana, which is means of tuning up the mind with what you want to know. And third is the jnana yoga, is a vichara, is a deliberation upon Brahman. <coughs> So it is traditional to generally talk about this intermediate step of meditation upon Brahman and medit- the Omkara is the name of Brahman therefore meditating upon Omkara is meditating upon Brahman. Because the word and the meaning are not, they, they are not separate from each other. The word automatically brings the meaning in your mind. When you utter the word part, the meaning of that word, flesh, flesh, flesh is in the mind. When I say mango, that meaning flesh is in the mind. So when it is a Brahman, the meaning should flesh in our mind. It does not do. <laughs> meaning that we have enough preparation in our mind. The mind has enough preparation for the words such as thought and mango to reveal their meaning. The mind does not have preparation for a Brahman to reveal its meaning. So that preparation is required, which is what is done here by, through meditation and, and worship. Then when does the mind become prepared? Then, when the teacher unfolds and says, you are Brahman, then that reveals in my mind. <clears throat> so, this all this background is created in the Shikeda for, I mean, all the preparations required for the knowledge to take place, and then Yamaraja the teacher proceeds to unfold now the nature of self, which is what Nachiketa wanted to know. Here a distinction between Atma and Brahman is not made, by the way. Because both are one. Just to go back to Nachiketa's question. In fact, Nachiketa has asked two questions. First question we read, when Nachiketa said that when a person dies, then this question remains whether is there a self other than the body or is body the self. So he asked, he asked for the knowledge of Atma. Subsequently he himself clarified this question, which was not included here. But he says, Anyatra dharmat, Anyatra dharmat, Anyatya smat, Krutha krutha, Anyatra bhuta cha bhavya cha, Yatat pashyasi tadvada. Says Nachiketa to Yamaraja, that that which you see, which you know as an immediate fact, as your own self, you please tell me. What is it? Anyatra dharmat, anyatra dharmat, that which transcends the idea of dharma and dharma, righteous and unrighteous. Anyatra bhuta cha bhavya cha, that which transcends the idea of past, present and future, meaning that which transcends time. Anyasma asmat krutha krutha cha, that which is also beyond what is done and what is not done. So he is asking about the transcendental truth, which is Brahman. So in a way, is, when he rephrases the question, he is as though asking about Brahman. However, keeping both the questions in mind, Yamaraja teaches him, meaning that the teacher teaches both Atma and Brahman because both of them happen to be one only. <clears throat> so now, let us take the next passage, number seven, which typically represents what Yamaraja taught Nachiketa, what the teacher taught the student. And it's a very famous verse also because we find this verse essentially repeated in the Bhagavad Gita. I say essentially, not totally, not verbatim, but more or less repeated in Bhagavad Gita. So let us read that. Najayate Mriyate Va Vipaschita Nayam Kutaschita Nabhuva 
कश्चित अजो नित्य शाश्वत पुराण नहन्यते हन्यमाने शरीरे बॉडी Body that is subject to birth, growth, and death. Although we feel that I was born at a certain this time, and now I am growing, and some day I'll grow old also, and some day I will die also. So we associate the birth, growth, death, all of these phenomena with ourselves. And if by association of those phenomena, I was Comfortable, happy. There is no problem. Even though that is not the reality of myself, Atma is not born. Atma does not die. But I think that I was born. I am going to die. If that conclusion or notion of the self on my part that I was born or that I am going to die, if I can be comfortable with that reality, then Vedanta is not required. Meaning that if I was comfortable with myself as I take myself to be, then we don't require this teaching. I'm going to die. Good, no problem. I fail, no problem. He insulted me, no problem. I'm growing old, no problem. I can't hear, no problem. If nothing creates problem to me, that means there's no problem in life. What is meant by problem is all of this make me sad. I can't hear. I you know I'm not comfortable. I can't see. I can't hear. I can't walk. I cannot get up. I'm going to die. I fail. I was insulted. All of these things that are happening in my life, all of these make me unhappy. So unhappiness is my problem. These are also not the problems. Unhappiness is the problem. All of these seems to seem to cause unhappiness to me. That I'm going to die. That makes me unhappy. Unfortunately, if I was comfortable with this inevitable event that I'm going to die, I'm, I'm having wrinkles on my face. I have no problem with that. Somebody left me. No problem with that. If nothing causes problem, nothing makes me unhappy, nothing makes me sad. I remain happy regardless of what is. Then we do not need anything because that is what we want. We want to be happy in all circumstances. What we are seeking is, I want to be happy, happy at all the times. Not only in the morning or in the afternoon, in the evening, morning, evening, afternoon, today, tomorrow, day after, twenty-four seven. And not only in one place, here, there, and everywhere, I want to be happy. Not, not when your boss is that, I then also want to be happy. Not my spouse, there, all everywhere, I want to be happy. At all times, at all places, and all conditions, I want to be happy. And when, if that is what I experience, there is no problem. Unfortunately, I experience sadness that denies me that happiness. So sadness happens to be a reality, as though a reality of our life, and that is the problem. Because when I am sad, I am not happy. That sadness denies me the happiness that I am seeking, and therefore sadness or sorrow becomes a problem. Because sorrow is opposite of happiness. When sorrow is that happy, it's mutually exclusive. It excludes happiness. Happiness cannot be. I don't want sorrow. So then, only this Vedanta has a role to play because I don't want sorrow. Then Vedanta teaches us what is the cause of sorrow. Nobody wants sorrow. 
and my my life is nothing but a constant attempt to eliminate, remove sorrow, get rid of sorrow. Sukha prapti, dukkha nivruti, all the time dukkha nivruti meaning that I am constantly striving to get rid of sorrow and attain happiness seems to happen momentarily and again it goes away. So Vedanta says that there is no cause of sorrow. The sorrow is caused on account of what you think the reality is. If you knew what the reality is, there is no occasion for sadness at all. And reality of your own self. Most is most important to me is the reality of myself. The perception you have of yourself is a wrong perception. So what we need is the right perception of myself. So in question of death, this was asked. The verse says here, na jayate mriyate va vipaschit. Here the self of the Atma is referred to as vipaschit. Vipaschit means in fact, all knowing. Here, vipaschit means a wise person. In our day to day language, the word vipaschit is a wise person. Here wise means how much wise? All knowing. We perceive all-knowing, the, the self, there is consciousness, all-knowing or consciousness that self is. Here all-knowing doesn't mean all-knowing in primary sense, that illumines all the knowledge. So consciousness that illumines all the knowledge, na jayate, that self is not born, na mriyate, does not die. Why is it necessary to say that? Why should you say that self does, is not born? And self does not die because I say I was born and I'm going to die. And when I say I'm going to die, I'm not happy about say, saying that. That is why, since death is the cause of my sorrow. Birth may sometimes, birth also is cause of sorrow. Well, why was I born here? Somebody says, you know, why was I not born there? Look at my friend, you know, his parents are so good, you are like this. And so I wish I was not born here also, sometimes. So sometimes birth can be a problem, death is definitely a problem. <laughs> and so he said, na jayate mriyate va vipaschit. Vipaschit, the all-knowing meaning that all illumining consciousness itself, na jayate, it is not born, na mriyate, it does not die. There is no birth and there is no death. In a shikata, there is no birth for you. You are not born and you do not die. That is what should be said actually. But instead he said that one, so in, in, in Bhagavad Gita also, I am, Lord Krishna is a pronoun, I am, this one is not born. Nāyam hanti nahanyate, Lord says, this one does not kill, is not killed. So instead of you, he said, I am, here also we perceive instead of you, what should have been, hey Nasiketa, you are not born, you are not going to die. But then Nasiketa may not quite understand what is meant by you. And so it's clear by Vipaschit. Who are you? You are Vipaschit. You are all-knowing. You are the consciousness. The consciousness that you are, does not the you that you think you are. The you that you think, you think you are born and you are going to die. But understand that, you should understand who you truly are. Vipaschit, the consciousness that you are, the jayate, there is no birth. Namriyate, there is no death. Nayam kutaschit, nababhuva kaschida. It did not originate from anything, nor did anything originate. Meaning that it is not the cause, it is not the effect. When you say it is not born. See, birth means what? Birth is an effect. So part is born. Part is born. How is it born? From clay. So clay is the cause. What is the effect? The effect is born. What is born is the effect, right? You say part is created. Or part is born. Which means that part, the effect is born. What is born is the effect. And that from which is born is called cause. So say Atma is neither cause nor effect. You are not born of anything, nor is anything. You may not be born of something, but something may be born of you. Atma may not be born. And something born of you, then they also get exhausted in course of time. 
So nothing is born of you. You are neither the cause nor the effect. Ajo nitya sashvatoyam prana ayam. This self is unbirthless, nitya, deathless, shashvataha, decayless, purana, growthless, no growth, no decay, no birth, no death, no growth, no decay, no change. The consciousness that you are is changeless. <coughs> but then am I, when this body dies, will I not die? Am I not in this body and therefore when the body dies and I who is in this body, the indwell of the body, would it not die? Says, na hanyate, hanyamane, sharire, when the body is killed, this one is not killed. Or when the body is injured, this one is not injured. It is totally independent of what happens to the body. <coughs> Here, you know, we can... What is that? Cushion. Oh, cushion. All right. You know, I was looking for a pot, actually. I thought that, it, I thought that, it, that is what it is. You know. But it doesn't matter. Imagine there is a pot in my hand. You know. And there is a space within the pot. It's called pot space, right? Pot and pot space. So, when the pot is broken, does the part space get broken? When the part is born, is the part space born? It is born, really. You know what is part space? Part space means the space enclosed in the part. When you use the expression part space, what is the idea created in our mind? Space that is enclosed in the part. Otherwise, you would call it space. So, when you use the word space, we, the idea is what? All expansive space. But when you use the word part space, what is the space? Space enclosed by the part. Is it not so? But is there something called space enclosed by the part? Can part enclose the space? Can part confine the space? The space confined in the part, is it possible that part can confine the space? It can enclose the space? It can divide the space from the rest of the space? Is it possible? To us it looks like there is space within the part. In fact, what is the fact is the part is within the space. But when you focus attention on the part, it looks like space is within the part. Therefore, to know truly what space is, shift the attention, focus from part to the space, then realize that it is not the space which is within the part, it is the part that is within the space. But what happens is, how the mind works, moment you see the part, and there is a space, you think there is space within the part. Automatically the part creates in our mind the idea of part space. Meaning that part seems to have the ability to create in my mind a notion or delusion. There is something called part space, as though the part is, is enclosing their space, circumscribing their space. It is confining their space within the boundary of its walls. That's the idea created. And there we said, hey, the part space is not. So part space is not born. Part space does not die. Then what is born? Pot is born, pot dies. What happens when the pot is born? In my mind, pot space also is born. When the pot is broken, I think pot space also is broken. That is what I think. In order to enable me to separate the space from the pot, I, I join them. When I use the expression pot space, I have managed to unite the two pot and space, like a, like a wedlock has happened between pot and space. That's called a granthi. Granthi means what? A knot. The pot and space are joined together in my mind. And thus a notion of pot space arises in my mind. So what I do in my mind is, I somehow managed to unite 
the part in space and that's how the idea of part space is created. Just think about this. When I think of part space, automatically in my mind, the space is confined to the part. The part is enclosing the space. As though walls of the part enclose that space and that enclosed space is called part space. Thus in my mind I have joined the two entities part and space and I come up with this notion part space. There is no physical entity called part space. There is a physical entity called part. There is an entity called space. Is there something called part space? Then where is that part space? Out there, there is a part and there is space. I think of part space. Where is that part space? It is, a, it is a notion in my mind, not a reality. So how our mind lumps the two things together, unites the two things together and comes up with his own concept of some name which is not really there, but think that it is there. Now, part space is an innocent example, you know, it doesn't, no big deal about that. But then, Najayate, we can teach. Now, the problem is, when space thinks that I am part space, not, not you thinking this is part space, go a step further. Imagine that the part space thinks that I am confined to this part. Imagine that. You follow? Mm -hmm. If the space thinks that I am circumscribed by the part, I am confined by the part, and therefore I am part space. If part space thinks, and then the part there, and the part space, and the hall is there, the hall space, and like there are so many spaces that are there, so many enclosures are there, as many enclosures are there, as many spaces are there, as though, if the space thinks so, that I am divided into so many enclosures and I am only this much confined to this part. I am not outside the part, I am smaller than that part space and look at how big it is, how fortunate that is and I am bigger than this, look at the little part space. So all complexes are there, I am inferior, I am superior, I am big, I am small, you know, then it will have also an astrological chart, you know, birth, when was I born, <laughs> please tell me what is my destiny, when am I going to die, <coughs> who says, part space. <laughs> because the death is certain for the one that is born, it knows that. So I'm going, I was born and then I will die. What, who says? Space says. Space thinks that I am part space and in this, and suffers from all these kinds of conclusive notions. And each notion only causes pain. But each notion creates an idea of confinement in the space. Space, whose nature is all pervasive, feels a sense of insignificance or confinement. And that is what makes it unhappy. I'm, I'm so small. I'm different from that. Yeah, that's, the bigger than my, that's bigger than me. That's not as good as me. All these complex are created. In the space comes up with this notion, I am part space. Sounds funny, isn't it? Well, that's exactly what it is. That's the example of our life. Not you saying that it is part space. Space says that I am part space. And so also the self says, the consciousness says, I am a jiva. I am a limited individual. I am a limited consciousness. I am a fraction of consciousness is another fraction of consciousness, a third fraction of consciousness. But that one is very fortunate. Look how beautiful that is and how accomplished that is. And look at me. And that's how comparison goes on. And all kinds of complexes are born. Miserable life. There can be nothing but misery. Moment the idea of confinement is there. There has to be comparison and there has to be various complexes. And then I try to overcome that by becoming bigger than that person so that I don't feel, you know, in his presence. And somebody else comes along who is bigger than that. Then again I try hard. Somebody else comes along. And so I become a 
supervisor, then I become manager, then I become area manager, then CEO, and goes on. Who is the biggest CEO? The president is the biggest CEO. Or you become the president of the country, biggest CEO, chief executive officer of the whole country, whole nation. Then there are other fellows, other CEOs are there. And they say, I'm bigger than you, you, you try. <laughs> You try to dominate me, let me see how you do that, I will dominate you. So that, that's how these things begin. <laughs> In the becoming, where is the end? Where is peace of mind? I don't think this soul has any peace of mind. At 2.30 if you send your tweeters, what do you must be doing? <laughs> where is sleeping or not? I don't know what's happening. But anyway, we, are not, we need not talk about a person like that. But what I am saying is that in spite of this, this kind of achievement, Highest achievement in the world, I think, is this achievement. But before you can even relish that achievement, all of a sudden, all sorts of things on your head are there. All burdens and complexes and anxieties and worries and need to prove yourself. Those other fellows are all wrong. I'm right. What they did is all wrong. What I'm doing is right. So, need, so much need to prove yourself. And to prove yourself by proving other people wrong, that's the only way you can prove yourself right. Now, this is a funny thing. Why can't they be right and you also say, no, I'm right only if they're wrong. All this complex. This is this is the story of everybody, and not only this person. He person is all right out out in the open. And he is he doesn't mind being exposed because he tells what is going on in his mind for the whole world. And says, Oh, I, I have not changed my thought now. All right. I did not mean that. No, I don't uh, what I said earlier, forget about it. Now this is what I say now. I agreed that, now I disagree, etc. And that is open, I guess. <laughs> so we can know what is going on in the mind and then of the person. And we have a satisfaction that he's like that. If I look at myself, not much different. Really. <laughs> it's always easy to assign all that stuff to somebody else, then we feel that we are all free from that. But he just only demonstrates what's going on in the human mind. That poor poor space. And so it is told, Najayate. What is born is pot is born, poor space is not born. What is going to die also is break is pot, pot will break, not poor space. Nahanyate, Hanyamane, Sharire. Says when the pot is broken, space doesn't get broken. Does it? Break the pot, does the pot space get broken? No. Similarly, the consciousness, all pervasive, all inclusive, feels a sense of confinement that I am within this body. I am the body, not only within, I am the body. I was born, I am growing, I am growing old, I am going to die. That's just one cause of sorrow we have in our life. Death, of course, is a major cause of the fear and never cause of sorrow. But there are millions of other things. I don't care for death, you may not care for death. But then somebody insults you, then you feel bad. So there are other causes. <coughs> sense of loss, sense of insult, sense of humiliation, so many things. An emotional level, intellectual level, egoistic level, so many ways I can be hurt. Not only physical way. Here death is presented here because I guess that is the most prominent thing in the life of a person, or death became the basis of the whole discussion. But death applies to only physical body. In the only physical body, yeah, death of the body alone is not the cause of sorrow. Then I can say still, I have, it's long time, I need not worry about it. Right? What is at the present? So many other things are there which causes me sorrow. <coughs> Gain and loss. Pleasure and pain, comfort and discomfort, gain and loss, honor and dishonor, praise and censure, success and failure. All these pairs of opposites constantly confront them. All of this belongs to part, does not belong to space. All of this belongs to body, mind, sense complex. At that level, all of these are there. There is comfort and discomfort. And there is success and failure. And there is honor and dishonor. There is censure and no, we don't say it is not there. Vedanta does not say there is no failure and no, it's there. 
but not where you think it is. That's all. The only problem is you should see where it is. At some point it is there, and that is in the Zupad, in the body mind complex, all of this is there. Birth also is there, there is another pair of opposites. Birth and death. Growth and decay. Honor and dishonor. Someday this body is praised, is worshipped, people wash feet, some other day is insulted. So honor, dishonor, censure, praise, all of this is there in life. We keep on fighting with them all the time. Honor comes, I can't hold on to that. Dishonor comes, I fight with that. Praise comes, I want to hold on to that. Censure, I won't fight with that. You can never. One thing goes, other, other thing comes. That goes and a third thing comes because life is full of this pairs of opposite. It's called dvandva. This way we will never come to an end. It's like the Don Quixote is fighting all the time in the air with something or the other. You must know that all this is there. But not where you think it is. There is success and there is failure. Where is there an intellect or ego? There is success and failure. Honor and dishonor. They are there. But not in the self. Not where you think it to be. And never, if you account for assign where it belongs, there is no problem. When the tree is felled, I don't feel felled. And therefore, as long as there is an objectivity, there is a distance between them, there is no problem. So here, it teaches us how to create the distance. Distance is there. Nanyate hanyamane sharire. If something happens to body, nothing happens to self. But I lump them together. The two things which are there are made into one by me because of identification. And thus, this teaches us how to contemplate upon the self. Who am I? The jayate, I am not born. Then what is born? The body is born. But the body is not my body. Something will die, no doubt. What is going to die? The body is going to die. There is not my death. So death is not our problem, understand? What is the problem? My death is a problem. When anything connect, is connected, I then it becomes a problem. Well, this is not a problem. Insult is not my problem. I am insulted, it is a problem. Failure is not a problem. I fail is a problem. If I know if I, that failure belongs, that some effort was made, that effort failed. As long as I am objective, but you know what I say? I failed. That's where the problem is. I made an effort. I succeeded. That's another problem also. Because fellow who brand him successful, he will brand tomorrow himself as failure. Because when things do not go his way. So, Vedanta does not say there is no success and no failure and no honor and no dishonor, no person, it's all there. But not where you think it is to be. They're all in non-self, not in the self. And that's all we need to know. Then in spite of all these things, I am free because nothing touches me. So, this is a beautiful verse here, which is given to us for contemplation upon the self as to what's the nature of myself. We must sit. I am all knowing, I am the consciousness that eliminates everything. So, we came up to this point in the last retreat. And now we will continue. In this retreat, we continue with the next passage. Whether you remember or not, but. I remember, I made a note anyway. <laughs> because so many retreats are there, and so many topics are there. So where I stop, where I make a note here. So my note says that, verse number 7 complete on such an, 25th of June 2017. <laughs> so now, turn to page number 6, and let us read the next Mantra. Even though the self is rather difficult to know, something that is very difficult to be very subtle. 
The self, to gain knowledge of the self is difficult. <coughs> but if you have the right means, it becomes possible. Even though Atma is Durvignaya, extremely difficult to know, still, if you employ the right means, it becomes knowable also. So how, what is the means of knowing the Atma? <coughs> That's what this passage tells us. <coughs> Nāya mātmā Pravachanena Labhyaha Namedhaya Nabahuna śrutena Yame vaiśa Karunate Tena labhyaha Tasyaiśa ātmā Vibhrnute Tanum Swam So the first line says what is not adequate to know the self. If you simply read the verse it says I am Atma Pravasanena Nalabhyah this Atma cannot be attained through Pravachanam or the recitation of the Vedas. We'll talk about that. Na medaya, not even by memory. Na bhavuna shrutena, not through lot of listening. So the way in the olden days the knowledge of the Vedas was gained by the students. When they sit at the feet of the teacher and teacher recites and the student repeats. This was the way. Apparently there was no written text. <coughs> and there were this all this knowledge was passed on from teacher to the student. When the teacher repeats something, recites something, then two student repeats. That's how it is so next is that's how it is memorized. And then it repeats again to make it firm. So three words are used here, pravachana, medha and shrutena. So pravachanam. Pravachanam means to recite the Vedas. The literal meaning of pravachanam means reciting the Vedas. So we are told that. When you study the Vedas from your teacher, make sure that you re retain that knowledge. Therefore, one of the duties is to recite the Vedas every day. So one who has learned this Vedas should not forget it. You learn the Veda and you forget it, you commit a great sin. As much as sin like killing a Brahma. It's called Brahmahatya. If you learn the Vedas and forget them, you as though killed them. You know, because what Brahma means Brahmana also, Brahma means Veda also. So forgetting Veda is like killing the Veda, is like killing Brahmana. And so, therefore everybody is always tight. You know, that therefore every day you should recite the Veda. It's called Pravachanam. First of all, Shrutena, you listen to the teacher. You listen to the teacher and medhaya. You retain the meaning of that. You retain it in your mind and pravachanam. Then you repeat. You see? Go to the teacher. The teacher recites and you listen and repeat. So you listen. You grasp and you repeat. That's how a text is mastered. So it says here that the Atma cannot, the knowledge of the Self cannot take place merely by mastering the Vedas. Merely by Shravanam, by Manam, by Niridhyasanam, merely by that you cannot gain the knowledge. Thank you, Swami. <laughs> <laughs> then we need not worry about listening to the scriptures. <laughs> No shramanam, no mananam, because they don't produce knowledge anyway. So why should we do that? So first line seems to say that. Then what should we do? That's what the second line says. So, 
Yame Vaishya Pranute, the second line says that it is attained only by the one who chooses the Atma. Tasisha Atma, Pranute Tanum Swam. To this aspirant, the Atma reveals its nature to himself. <coughs> we'll take up this verse in the next class and discuss what it means. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnapurnamudachyade Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyade Om Shanti 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 Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Badarayanam Sutra Vashya Pradao